These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Not every work of Gilgamesh is part of the epic itself, and not all of them even properly follow the continuity of the work we have today. But that's fine, heck, even Star Wars can't always keep it all straight, and that's only eight movies over 50 years, while the Gilgamesh franchise would have been spread over dozens of cities in hundreds of years. But that's okay. Our characters are flexible enough to fit in a lot of situations. And when so little of the corpus of work has survived, it would be a shame to throw out any of it. And so today, we'll look at a few of the miscellaneous adventures before we finally reach the climax of the epic, the battle with the Bull of Heaven, and the journey to Utnapishtim. Now today, we're beginning with a special treat. All these stories are, of course, the oldest stories. But here, the tale of Gilgamesh is going to intersect with the oldest single piece of writing ever found by archaeologists. Because while Gilgamesh himself lived somewhere around 2700 BCE, the written records we have of his legend date from a few centuries to a full millennium after this. But if you go to the companion post for this episode over at oldeststories.net, then you can see for yourself an image of the Kish tablet, a small chunk of clay with early proto-cuneiform writing on it, dating to the generation before Gilgamesh himself. And through the linkage of this physical evidence and the interconnected narratives of Kish and Uruk, we will prove to any lingering doubters that Gilgamesh was a historical person with at least as much contemporaneous historical evidence as we have for, say, Jesus or Alexander the Great. Which is to say, of course, basically none. The ravages of history are pretty brutal. But that won't stop us. Onward to the tale of Gilgamesh and Aga. Bronze Age Mesopotamia was made up of dozens of city-states, each springing up from the population surplus made possible by the agriculture of the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. But though we call them cities and reference the Mesopotamian civilization, in reality, these mostly had the population of modern small towns, and it was fairly difficult for most people to travel what we would think of even as short distances. Trade occurred, but the majority of everything made in a city would be used in that same city. Messengers would take days, if not weeks, but still, as the petty kings of these tiny towns began to organize their populace and conscript their labor force, it gradually became possible to make war on neighboring towns. How wonderful! But as we saw with King Enmerkar's war against Arata in our first two episodes, these weren't wars so much as extended raids, and indeed we even saw this last episode with the extended raid into the Forest of Cedars. Uruk sent troops in our first two episodes to Arata, and after winning the fight, they returned home with a bounty of slaves, wealth, and what amounted to a promise by the government of Arata that they acknowledged the superiority of Uruk and would send taxes occasionally. But the more distant the conquered town, the less likely Uruk would actually be able to enforce any peace agreement after the soldiers had left. And so, after accounting for the physical losses of the war, life would go on pretty much as it always had in Arata, and eventually the Aratans would get tired of sending taxes and pretending to submit to the other city, and then Uruk would respond by either sending another expedition to bring them back into line, or they'd simply fall out of Uruk's hegemony. And so it was that in any given generation, a particularly vigorous city would establish a small empire, and it would gradually fall apart, while some other city in the next generation would take its place. And so around 3000 BCE, it was the city of Kish, about 50 miles south of modern Baghdad, under the leadership of King Enmabargesi, who had established dominance over what we would consider the middle of modern Iraq. He is the king who commissioned the Kish tablet, the oldest known writing tablet. He would clash with the mostly forgotten King Dumazid, who reigned between Lugalbanda and Gilgamesh. 
but be unable to assert his control so far south, and even suffered a humiliating defeat in battle, or at least according to our Urukian records. Well, after 900 years as king, Enmubar Gesi would die and pass the throne on to his son, the much more simply named King Aga of Kish. And so, in the time of Aga and Gilgamesh, the major power in the north was Kish, while the rising power in the south was Uruk. In fact, last episode we ended with Gilgamesh sending the prime cedar from his attack on Humbaba to the temple of Enlil in Nippur, a city about halfway between Kish and Uruk. But we also have records from the temple complex Tumal, dedicated to the god Enlil and his wife goddess Ninlil in Nippur, stating that it enjoyed the patronage of Enmabar Gesi, and later of his son Aga, before experience a bit of neglect, after which point it records receiving patronage from King Gilgamesh, and then of later kings of Uruk. And so we are at an inflection point in regional power in Mesopotamia when our story opens. Gilgamesh was in the middle of overseeing a major public works project. He had conscripted a huge number of men and devoted a large amount of tax revenue to the project of digging wells for drinking and agriculture. Many would have been repair jobs on old wells whose beams had begun to decay and that had started to collapse on themselves while some would be deepenings of existing wells and still others would be wholly new to accommodate the rising population of the land of Kulaba where Uruk stood as capital. And he was not afraid to get his hands dirty. We have accounts of him taking part in the digging and construction work personally. But on this day, he was taken from that work to meet a foreign envoy who had come from the northern city of Kish with a missive fairly similar to the one we saw in the tale of Enmerkar and Arata, demanding, in essence, that Uruk submit and give tribute to Kish or face annihilation. But interestingly, Gilgamesh did not answer the envoys right away. Instead, he convened his council of elders from last episode, showing again that he feels obligated to receive some sort of popular assent for his policies. He carefully chooses his words, saying, We cannot afford to submit to Kish. We are in the middle of a massive well-digging project, and giving over the tribute they are demanding will slow the development of our land unacceptably. Instead of submitting, we should attack. The city elders replied in kind, saying, We cannot afford to not submit to Kish. We are in the middle of a massive public infrastructure project, and not only would it be too expensive to defend ourselves, but a war would expose all these new wells to destruction. Pay their taxes, give them their pretty words, and Uruk can develop in peace. Gilgamesh discarded this advice as soon as it reached his ears. He had the blessings of Ishtar, goddess of love, goddess of war, and so he called another town meeting, this time assembling from the young men conscripted for his work levies, meeting out in the fields of Kulaba. He told them about the envoy from Kish and told them what the elders had said, but the young men were having none of that. Those old folks, they're just too tired from living too long, they said. We have total faith in our king to beat back any army, and we are brave enough to stand at your side. And so, having acquired a popular mandate, Gilgamesh returned to the palace and informed the Kishite envoy that Uruk would not be submitting to King Aga today, or in fact, ever. The envoy bowed politely and left. Gilgamesh turned to his friend Enkidu and instructed him to make preparations for the coming battle, and let me know when the army is on the horizon. But these preparations apparently did not include scouting, because not ten, not even five days later, the army of Kish, with King Aga at the head, had arrived and surrounded the walls of Uruk. The besieging army was expected, but not this quickly. They must have been just outside Kulaba when they sent the messenger, and the city was thrown into confusion. The Kishites signaled for a parley. 
Gilgamesh called up his soldiers, who, remember, were basically the same people in his conscript well-digging levy five days earlier, and asked for a volunteer to go out and meet with the invaders. It was Birhar Tura, the royal guardsman, who enthusiastically volunteered. Now, this guy doesn't get too many lines in this story, but from what he does get, you can see that Birhar Tura was a true believer a happy and enthusiastic zealot whose greatest pride in life is serving the man he believes to be a literal god. With a volunteer selected, the meeting adjourned and everyone went to go man the walls while Gilgamesh took the senior leaders in for a strategy meeting. And after the strategy meeting, Gilgamesh went deeper into the palace to make a final prayer and prepare himself for battle. In any case, the largest of the seven gates of Uruk opened just enough to permit the brave and loyal Birhar Tura to pass. He walked out under a flag of parley to the reception area among the Kishite army. Then, unarmed and acting as a diplomat, he was jumped by a dozen of the faithless Kishite dogs who tied him up and beat him ragged. They then lifted his bound body like a sack of potatoes and popped him down in front of King Aga's portable throne. Though his lips were swollen and bleeding and his neck bruised, his voice did not waver as he delivered his god king's message. Uruk would not submit to Kish, but the god king would be willing to discuss certain terms with the mortal king Aga. Now, while Birhar Tura had been getting beaten, the senior command meeting had concluded, and a man dressed in resplendent finery climbed to the top of the wall to look out at the besieging army. This forestalled the empty boast King Aga was about to make when he pointed out the finely dressed man standing behind a rank of soldiers on the wall. He laughed, and he asked Birhar Tura, Slave, is that man your king? And then it was Birhar Tura's turn to laugh. That man is not tall enough. His gaze is not terrifying enough. He is attractive, but not perfectly formed, and his beard alone does not inspire worship. That is one of our senior officers. If it was our king, he could walk into the middle of this army all alone, crush a multitude single-handed, wreck all of your riverboats with his bare hands, and take you, King Aga, captive in the middle of your own army. Now, for this insolence, King Aga ordered Birhar Tura beaten senseless, kicking and whipping in full view of the defenders of Uruk. Gilgamesh was below handing out battle maces to his army when he was called up to the battlement, and when he ascended the city wall, his radiance drew the attention of everyone in the Kishite army who dropped what they were doing to stare at this perfectly formed golden giant. And Aga of Kish, unable to take his eyes from the god king, asked Birhar Tura, Slave, is, is that man your king? And as the blood flowed freely from Birhar Tura's body, he opened his eyes and looked one last time at the city of Uruk and the golden splendor of Gilgamesh. And the last words that passed his lips were, That man is indeed my king. And out from the gate of Uruk came two men, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Enkidu led the way as they walked casually to the portable throne of King Aga, clearing the path of bodies and creating a red carpet of blood on the sand for his king to walk on. And there, in the middle of the Kishite army, Surrounded by bodies broken like cheap dolls, Gilgamesh stood before the frozen Kishite king and, like livestock, put a guiding rope around his neck. Aga, he spoke as if to an old friend. In my youth we met in Kish, and we had such a nice time together. I owe you much from those days, but I'm grown now, and I no longer depend on you, kind Aga. Now, in memory of the kindness you did for me in those older days, I will send you back to be my governor of the conquered land of Kish, and I will make you my general of the north. 
Gilgamesh removed the rope leash, saying, In the sight of Shemesh the sun, I hereby repay you for your former kindness. In the future, send gifts, not soldiers. And the vassal king Aga took his surviving soldiers and fled north. Uruk's hegemony over the region grew with this victory, and neither king spared much thought for the loyal men who died in the fighting. Because that's the way of it. A good man lays his life down and devotes himself completely to his gods and his god king, even though the concerns of those gods are on a much higher level. That was the tale of Gilgamesh and Aga, but I promised multiple stories today, so we're going to transition pretty hard from a tale that was straightforward and almost certainly historical to one that is more poetic, almost dreamlike in feel. Though much of Sumerian poetry consists of endless repetition that surely loses quite a lot in translation. Still, the tale of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the underworld is a curious piece even if the narrative is a bit weak and it doesn't really fit anywhere in the continuity of the general epic. It begins long before the age of civilization on the banks of the Euphrates River. There on the river, a single halib tree had been placed along the banks by the gods themselves. Ishtar, goddess of love and war, had been respectful to the senior gods, Anne and Enlil, and so as a reward, they promised to create for her the finest of furniture, a nice chair and a fancy bed frame. But doing things directly is simply not how the gods, especially the senior gods of the heavens, operate. And so, instead of just giving her a chair or even an Ikea gift card, they placed this halib tree along the banks of the Euphrates River. And it was growing well, and when the time came, the gods sent a powerful wind to uproot it and drop it into the river, whereupon it floated for a time until a divine priestess of Ishtar was walking just outside of town and spotted it. She knew immediately that this piece of driftwood was a divine gift for her goddess Ishtar, and so, being very careful to not touch it directly with her hands, she took it to the inner garden at the temple of Ishtar in Uruk, being so careful not to defile it with her hands that she planted and watered it only with her feet, which is apparently exactly right and proper and not more disrespectful, as would seem to me, but in any case, the goddess Ishtar every day would come out of her palace and go into her garden and look at the tree. And every day she wondered when it would turn into a fine chair and a fine bed frame for her comfort. Five years passed, then ten, and the tree grew absolutely massive, but the bark never split, indicating maturity for this tree species. And in the lush gardens of Ishtar, a snake, somehow immune to the magical protections of the garden, began to make its nest in the roots. And a young Anzu bird flew in from the mountains and made its nest in these luxurious branches. And even a young maid of the temple carved out a hollow into the trunk and took up residence. So much for respecting the sanctity of the tree. And Ishtar went into the garden one day and saw this and threw an absolute fit. This was her tree that was going to be her bed and her chair, and somehow everyone else got to enjoy it except for her. It just wasn't fair. And so Ishtar went to her brother, the god Shamash, who was the sun itself and also the god of justice, and laid out her case. Look, she said, this tree was promised to me ages ago, and I've always done the right thing and been respectful to the senior gods, and then my priestess took super good care of the tree, even watering it with her feet so as not to defile it with her hands. But now look at it. People and animals get to enjoy the tree, but somehow I, goddess Ishtar, am still being made to wait for my chair and my bed frame. This is all so upsetting, and I can't even. And Shamash 
barely even looked over at his sister and said, Stop talking so much. No one cares about your stupid tree. Well, Ishtar was so upset that she ran out of her temple and ran over to the royal palace just down the street and cried to Gilgamesh. But after hearing her story, Gilgamesh was willing to take time from the duties of being king, like instituting public works projects and sleeping with newly wedded brides, and went over to Ishtar's temple garden to examine the situation. Well, it was just as she had said, so Gilgamesh took out his 180-pound bronze and gold great axe that he just casually kept on his belt as he went around all day, and in a flash chopped the snake at the roots. He took a swipe at the young Anzu bird, pulling the nest from the tree, and the bird flew off into the mountains. And there in the hollow in the trunk, the young maid stood paralyzed before the axe-wielding god-king as he glared at that woman. Gilgamesh grunted aggressively, and the young woman fled the city, never to return. Gilgamesh then grabbed the tree, which, despite its bulk, was uprooted with one mighty pull, and used the battle axe to clean off the branches. Now, this part of the tale is particularly garbled, with the clay tablets having suffered heavily at this specific paragraph. What is clear is that Gilgamesh went to the carpenter's shop, and hand-carved the tree into a fine bed and chair for Ishtar, which presumably pleased the goddess greatly. But then he had wood left over for himself. Now, this seems to have been a game that was growing fashionable in the city at that point, which involved swinging a mallet at a ball, vaguely like a Mesopotamian form of golf, as far as I can tell. And it had taken the city by such a storm that all the young men in the city played constantly, and the women of the city would bring bread and water to their men only to be neglected. Oh, that's no good. Well, Gilgamesh used that leftover wood to make for himself a ball and mallet of divine wood, and he picked up the game and never wanted to stop playing. He never wanted to stop praising himself either in the public square, and finally, the women of the city were sick of it. And so, at sunset one day, Gilgamesh was in front of the carpenter's house and was finishing up his game for the day. And so he marked the spot where his ball lay so that he could pick the game back up again tomorrow. Then overnight, the women of the town laid a trap at that very spot and covered it up well. When Gilgamesh went out to finish the game the next morning, he put his ball and mallet on the ground at the marked spot, except that the floor there was just an illusion. It was a pitfall trap, and both ball and mallet fell through the ground all the way to the netherworld. And Gilgamesh ran over to the Temple of Ganser, which was the temple that held the gate to the netherworld, and sat in front of the gate of Ganser, highly agitated. It's a bit like tossing a frisbee into the neighbor's yard, but in this case, the neighbor was actually hell, the literal afterlife. And Gilgamesh was more than a bit worried about simply knocking on the door and asking for it back. Fortunately, loyal Enkidu was there and said, Don't worry, Gilgamesh, I will go into the afterlife and get your ball and mallet for you. Ah... Gilgamesh was hesitant, but he said, if you're going to go in there, you need to follow my instructions to the letter. Don't deviate on any point, or you will be trapped forever in the afterlife. Well, we can already see where this is going, but the instructions are, wear dirty clothes and no fine oils or perfumes. Don't bring a fine cornel wood stick in your hand. Don't wear sandals either. Don't shout too loud, and if the spirits surround you, don't throw sticks at them. These things will draw attention to you in the underworld, and you will get trapped. Also, if you see your dead wife and child, don't kiss them, and definitely don't hit them. Enkidu nodded absently at this list of instructions, and then passed through the gate of Ganser into the afterlife, and proceeded to violate every single one of them. 
He wore fancy clothes that were so unfamiliar in the netherworld and drew a lot of attention to himself. When the ghost of his wife and child floated by, he kissed them affectionately. But then they started to talk and get irritating, and he beat them both in annoyance. Enkidu was a man of his times for sure, but goodness, what a jerk. And in drawing attention to himself, he gets trapped, just like Gilgamesh said he would. Now Gilgamesh has lost his ball, his mallet, and his best friend. And so he goes to the temple of his great-grandfather Enki and pleads to have Enkidu return to him. He says, Grandfather, please. Enkidu has fallen into the underworld, but he isn't really dead. He wasn't beaten by the god of death, Namtar. He wasn't slain by the demon Azag. He wasn't killed by Nurgle, god of pestilence and plague. He did not fall in battle. And so Enki took pity on the god king and ordered Shamash the sun to go fetch Enkidu from the underworld. No mention is made of the ball and mallet at this point, but Enkidu, or possibly Enkidu's ghost, is able to return. The two men hug and kiss, but quickly Gilgamesh is overcome by curiosity and has Enkidu sit down. Tell me what you saw in the netherworld, Gilgamesh asks. Now here the narrative portion ends, and we have multiple fragments of what might be theological and might, what might be, I don't know, some sort of formulaic call and response about the afterlife. Uh, it might even be comic at times, because while it seems like many of the entries are written seriously, some seem to have almost taken the format and slipped in a few possibly comic ones, though maybe I'm just trivializing it from my modern point of view and they should all be taken as literal religious gospel. In any case, Gilgamesh and Enkidu sit down to discuss what he saw in the underworld. Gilgamesh asks, Did you see the man who has only one son? I saw him, Enkidu replies. How does he fare? Gilgamesh asks. And Enkidu answers, He weeps bitterly, having been driven into the wall by a wooden spike. And the rest of this section all follows in the same pattern. Did you see the man with two sons? I saw him. How does he fare? He sits on a few bricks, eating bread. And the man with three sons? He drinks water from a saddle water skin. And with four sons? His heart rejoices like a man rich enough to own four donkeys. And with five sons? He is allowed in and out of the heavenly palace. And with six sons? He's cheerful as a plowman. And with seven sons, he is a companion to the gods on the throne. The reproductive commentary continues. Did you see the palace eunuch? Oh, he's propped in a corner like a useless stick. And did you see the woman who never gave birth? Ah, like a broken chamber pot. She is thrown away violently and gives no man joy. Bronze Age this may be, but seriously? In any case, there are fates not directly tied to sex in the underworld. Did you see the spirit of him who has given no funerary offerings? He eats the scraps and the crumbs tossed in the street. Did you see the leper? He's given food and water, but he's kept apart from the city of the dead. Did you see him who lied to the gods? He drinks nothing but urine, living at the toilet of the netherworld. Did you see him who is eaten by a lion? He has no hands or legs. Did you see him who fell off a roof? They can never put his bones straight again. Did you see him who has no respect for his mother and father? His body and limbs are in constant agony. Did you see my stillborn children who never got a chance to live? They play happily at a table of gold and silver and snack on honeyed and buttered treats. And finally, did you see him who was set on fire? No, I did not see him. His spirit is not around. His smoke went up to the sky. There are more such, though many are fragmentary. We could see, however, that there is a broad mix of both situations and of divine punishments. Many of these are obviously moral injunctions, most particularly toward a moral duty towards reproduction. 
But also, just as in real life, mere circumstances, like falling off a roof, can lead to a lifetime of suffering. It seems like a grim place, the land of the Sumerian dead, where both the unfortunate and the immoral get to suffer. But at least if you live ethically, which includes having many children, and manage to avoid any accidents, then you can have a pleasant afterlife. And it is nice to see a divine, happy daycare for the children who are lost to us. In any case, last time I did promise to tell of the spurning of Ishtar and the Bull of Heaven as well, but this episode is already running a bit long, and so, as a liar, I will drink urine from the toilets of hell. We will get to the next episode, which will bring us back on track with the main plot of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And so join me next time as we see Gilgamesh, who can defeat any foe and overcome any obstacle, come to learn that no one ever wins when you scorn a woman. Thank you for listening.